Welcome back to the Pig Trail Show. We are now joined by our Hogville insider, Kevin McPherson, for our Hog Hoops Report. Kevin, it's been a wild weekend to start March Madness for the Razorbacks. How are you feeling so far? Well, I'm caught up in the madness, Nick. I mean, <laughs> why should Arkansas get a pass from what other teams go through, right? You see all the these double-digit seeds. There's always upsets, and uh, Arkansas certainly could have been one of those, but uh, – if you look at, at really what's been the mantra of this team all year when it turned things around in mid-January, uh, it's not just how good it's been defensively. That's where they've been consistent. But I think it's the idea when you get into a tight situation late in games, you're down to two, three, four possessions. This team is not only resilient, but it pushes the right buttons to cross that finish line first. That's what winning's about. And when you're in a late tournament, style points are great, but they don't matter. Winning is what matters. And however mm -hmm. you get that done is how you get it done. Arkansas is the, as we speak, is the only SEC team to get to the second weekend, uh, the Sweet 16 for a second consecutive season. That hadn't happened in the program in 26 years. You have to go back to 94, 95, 95, 96. And those teams went to back-to-back -back Sweet 16s at the back end of four consecutive for the program when it was at its height. So you look at where Arkansas is right now, making a statement and carrying the banner for the SEC. Auburn's got a chance to get in today, the two seed in the, in the Midwest region. But I think Arkansas is the model for these higher level seeds, figuring out ways to beat those double digit seeds. And you like Arkansas's chances moving forward because of the blueprint all season long against no matter who they play. They're going to mm -hmm. face number one Gonzaga. They've beaten a number one this year. Granted, That's that was true. a yeah, good point. Rip, they found ways to win. They beat Kentucky beat Tennessee, some of the top teams. Now, those teams are out, uh, so we'll see what what the worth is for these Arkansas Razorbacks going forward as they shift from Buffalo, Buffalo, New York, on the east part, east coast part of the country to the west coast in San Francisco in just a few days. Let's break down those two first games to get them to the Sweet 16. They take down Vermont 75-71, to 71, a gutty win against a double-digit seed that, like you said, a lot of double digits were making waves in that first weekend. They get past Vermont. And then it's defense. I mean, New Mexico State, you face, um, they upset, a, they were a 5 12 upset. They win 53 to 48 to move into the Sweet 16. What did you see from Vermont, the New Mexico game? They kind of seem like kind of polar opposites. One had a lot of scoring, one had none at all. So, how do you break down those two matchups? Well, I start with the similarities, and it goes back as a reflection of what Arkansas did in to fix its season. We talked about the defensive end. On offense, Arkansas has not been a good shooting team, not from beyond the three-point arc, not necessarily inside the arc. And with turnovers, it's up and down. You had a low turnover game against Vermont, high turnover game really against New Mexico State. But the common theme is Arkansas has been one of the best blue-collar teams in terms of attacking the basket, and getting to the free throw line. Arkansas throughout most of the season was, you know, top five in free throws made per game, attempted per game, often sitting at number one. The percentage was really high, over 75%. And what did Arkansas do in both of these, these games? It beat those teams getting the free throw line combined against Vermont and New Mexico State. Arkansas shot uh, 42 of 50 from the free throw line. That's 84%. Those two teams combined, 16 of 27, that's under 60%. But think about that disparity, 42 points versus 16 points in games you won by four against Vermont and five against New Mexico State. Arkansas won those games by being blue collar. There are times when Arkansas tends to, especially early in games, take what the defense gives them in terms of taking open threes. It's really not Arkansas's game. They have to scheme and figure out ways to get going downhill and get to the basket. And I thought against New Mexico State, shifting from Vermont, especially with J.D. Note, he did not fall in love with that three-point line like he sometimes does. Three attempts, yeah, he missed a jillion layups. But the guy was going hard to the basket. And I think it's that mentality that gets Arkansas to the free throw, and you have to do that. And, you know, like, it, like I said earlier, it doesn't matter how you get it done. You get it done. Mm -hmm. uh, in a game where Vermont outscored Arkansas by 11 points on field goals, Arkansas gets 22 free throws made out of 25 compared to – New Mexico State, 6 of 10. So, you know, you, you've got to credit Arkansas because this isn't something new. This is part of their DNA and blueprint on offense the season. We know the defense has been there. We know that's been a really been the calling card. It's been the most consistent part of it. But on offense, I always keep my eye on Eric Mussman in-game adjustments, getting his team to understand where the bread and butter is, and that's attacking the basket. 
And I think that's part of why Arkansas, we're seeing this team advance to the Sweet 16. Take down Vermont. You take down New Mexico State. You're in the Sweet 16. And as you mentioned earlier, you get the number one team in the entire bracket. You're going up against Gonzaga. And that's a tough, that's a tough matchup. I mean, they've been rolling all through the tournament. They had some close games in this one so far. What do you see from this now one and four matchup, Arkansas and the Bulldogs? Well, it's the number one overall seed for a reason. AP top ranked team. Uh, if you look at Ken Palm Analytics, which I do a lot, it looks takes takes a look not only at stats but efficiency and other things that go into why teams have success. Gonzaga is the number one overall team, number one on offense, number nine on defense. When you look at statistics, Gonzaga is in the top one, two, three, top ten on both sides of the ball. Free field goal percentage, two point field goal percentage, top twenty five and three point field goal percentage. You know, number one in defensive rebounding, top six in block shots, you know, top three or four in assists. So on both sides of the ball, you start to see why this Gonzaga team is so good. You look at it individually, Drew Timmy, the veteran, the junior 6'10 big man, two-time consensus second-team All-American. You've got the seven-footer, you know, who's a lottery pick, Chad Holgram. You know, the discussion becomes, is he top five guy? Uh, but he averages nearly a double-double and nearly four blocks a game. And then you look at the backcourt and the wing play. Uh, you know, Ryan Nebhart, the, the, who runs things for that team, 5.8 assists a game, uh, is a guy that transferred from Florida two years ago. So Arkansas's program's familiar uh, with this player. Uh, but with so much turnover, this will be a first look at him and some other guys. They go eight deep. Uh, so there's not a, a, a necessarily a concern about a very deep bench versus how Arkansas plays going 6-7. Uh, so there's there's some comparisons there. But when I look at this matchup, we can talk all day long about what makes Gonzaga so good, Nick, but let's look at what makes Arkansas so good. And let's talk about the individuals. We talk about J.D. Note. We know he was a top, one of the top scorers in the SEC. We know that he leads the league in steals. Uh, that lead grew last night after that eight steal performance uh, against New Mexico State. But I think what makes him special is he's unfazed by his bad stretches. You know, he may have a turnover uh, or a foul, miss some shots. But he digs back in and he keeps being J.D. Note. And the makeup of this roster, you don't want to rein him in. You want him, J.D., to be J.D. JD Note. And I think it starts with him. I think he's got to play his game. Uh, you don't want him falling in love too much with the three shot. Some of his strengths are getting downhill, and I think that can help others. You, you look at Jalen Williams, back to his double-double ways in both games, double-doubles. That's what you need from him. You need him to score, give you some of that scoring, give the defense something to think about around the basket, but he gets on the boards. Arkansas desperately needs that playing against Gonzaga, one of the top rebounding teams in the country. But I look at Adis Tony, whether he's scoring in double figures for you or not, and he's going to give you some, some tough blue-collar plays around the basket on offense. He's been Arkansas's most consistent perimeter defender all year. And you look at what he did against Teddy Allen, 37 points for New Mexico State in the first round of that upset win over UConn. He had 12 points last night. Didn't shoot the ball well. Arkansas took him out of his game. I think the other part was he just looked uncomfortable. He had some turnovers, didn't have any assists. Some of the other things he does playing off his ability to score, and I thought Arkansas took a lot of that away, most of it away, and that was Adis Tony. You look at Stanley Umide, his first-round performance against Vermont, 21 points, nine rebounds, three assists, a couple of blocks. That's one of the most complete performances by a Razorback in an NCAA tournament that I can remember in some time. And then last night, the scoring wasn't necessarily there. He hits a big three late in a run Arkansas had. But he had three big assists where the defenses were starting to key on him, and he hit cutters going to the basket at just the right time. In a game low on offense, and Arkansas's field goal makes were very low, you needed plays like that because that helped generate easy offense for the Razorbacks. So I think when you start looking at the pieces, Devo Davis, big first game against Vermont. Second game, not as much scoring, but hits two big free throws late and made some big plays. I thought he gutted out some of those 50-50 ball wins that he's done in the past. He seems to be a guy that rises up in the NCAA tournament. You need that. And then Chris Light, 7-7 seven seven at the foul line. If anything else, this guy's automatic when you put him in those situations, and he was 4-4 four four in the last 10 seconds of the game to keep stretching that one-possession lead into two-possession lead against New Mexico State so the Aggies were not able to you know, pull even or get it to overtime or even win at the end. So I think when you start looking at the individual pieces that Arkansas has, to put themselves in this situation. It's not just about what Gonzaga has, it's about what Arkansas has. And Eric Musselman, to me, is the X factor. He will scheme, he will figure out ways uh, to put his guys in position to have their best chances based on 
not only what Gonzaga does well as a team overall, but individual pieces and what their preferences all are. Do they go left, right? Where are their sweet spots? He tries to take that away. Arkansas is not always successful taking everything away, but if they can get one or two guys uncomfortable and, and, and get, get things going in Arkansas's advantage, then they can be in a close game late. And we've seen it play out so many times that way that Arkansas, again, finishes up, that finish, gets over that finish line first. Winter circle. Arkansas would love to get back to an elite eight for back-to-back -back seasons after now getting to sweet 16s and back-to-back -back mm -hmm. season. They're going to need every single piece they, they have to perform against Gonzaga. As you mentioned, they have a couple of guys who are guaranteed first rounders in the NBA on that roster right now. And before we were on camera, we were talking about Arkansas and the Zags are also competing outside of the court on the recruiting trail for one of the biggest names in this upcoming class, Anthony Black. What's the update on him? Can you tell us a little bit about who he is? Well, he's a five-star. He's a top 20 guy. We know Arkansas is flush with five stars. You can never be too, too flush, right? Nick Smith Jr., <laughs> Jordan Walsh already signed in the early period. The number two ranked recruiting class in the country could get a little richer if you get Anthony Black. He took an unofficial visit to Arkansas uh, back in February, about a month ago for the Tennessee game. Arkansas won that on its home court. And it was another game that went to the wire. And, and, you know, he was excited about that atmosphere. And I really thought for the first time in Arkansas's recruitment of him that Arkansas kind of came from the background and maybe took the lead there. I felt like they were in the lead, maybe in the driver's seat. Uh, everything I've heard from his, you know, from DFW area where he's from, 6'7 combo guard out of Duncanville, Texas, a uh, guy that's going to be in the McDonald's All-American All game with Smith Jr. and Jordan Walsh. Uh, but a guy that I thought Arkansas really finally maybe – you know, close the gap on and maybe took a lead there. But Gonzaga's right there. You know, Oklahoma State's in the background. Uh, but I think Gonzaga is maybe feeling good about its chances. There's been some stuff come out this week, including one of my sources. It feels like maybe Gonzaga is, is taking the lead. So we're going to see where this plays out. I'm not convinced that it's still not Arkansas. And he may, he told me when I interviewed him last month that he was looking at later in March. And I've heard maybe the McDonald's All American game, which is March 29th. So that would be late mm. March. For him to make an announcement it's just interesting now if he's still undecided you know maybe there's some things he can pick up watching this game uh, between gonzaga and arkansas it's not maybe it's not just about who get advances to the elite a but maybe it's who advances in the anthony black sweepstakes so it's something to keep an eye on <laughs> he may already have his mind made up with nil you know he's got pro options but with those things in play you just never know has he made his mind up and he's just waiting for that time where he can announce we also see five-star guys that wait to the spring. They set announcement date, and then they change their mind. They back off. Something's not completely satisfying with their options, and so they extend it more. We need to see how this plays out, Nick, but I'm not in a position now, no matter what I've heard in the last few days about Gonzaga and, the, and, and Gonzaga, how it feels about where it stands with this young man. I, I'm not at a place where I'm prepared to back off. Uh, I'm not saying Arkansas is in the lead. I, I have felt like they are, but I'm not sure that they're not, and so I, I'm going to keep it there with Anthony Black, but when, when you look at Arkansas's recruiting, the success they've had, not only in recruiting, but then it starts to snowball because the recruits from that 2020 class that was ranked top five in the country have helped Arkansas now, not only do well in the SEC, not only do well in rankings, but they back it up in the postseason. That's more exposure for players mm -hmm. and it's more opportunity to, to, to build on their resume for the next level. So it, it each thing helps the other. If you advance in the NCAA tournament after a strong season, it helps your recruiting even more. So I think Arkansas, whether they get Anthony Black or not, are in an advantageous spot right now because we also know it's portal recruiting season. I want to talk a little bit about mm -hmm. that. Well, there might be ripple effects that go beyond just this game against the Zags into the future of Arkansas. And when we go to the portal and we look at the guys they brought in last year, Stanley Amude, Audis, Tony, when we talked to them, it was, I saw that Elite Eight run. I loved what I saw. I want to be on a team that wins and has a chance to be in the postseason. Amude from South Dakota, he's, he's now in the NCAA tournament for the first time because he came to Arkansas. That portal is attractive because people understand Arkansas can win games and get to the postseason. Could it benefit them here? What do we know about maybe some portal guys? Absolutely, and that's the point. The year before that, it was Justin Smith and Jalen Tate. They helped establish now maybe what's becoming a trend of yeah, you're recruiting well on the high school level. We've talked about it, but also out of that portal, and we see Musselman blending those pieces together. And so it's a it's a great dynamic as a recruiting tool, 
But then you look at the portal now. Portal season's going. Arkansas still has a season, yet they they don't take a day off. They're all up in that portal, at least 15 to 20 prospects that I know for a fact they've contacted, probably more than that. Wow. But I've talked to several of them. A couple I'm just going to talk about right now, Jalen Ganey, a 6'9", big man uh, out of Brown. Back-to-back -back defensive player of the year in the Ivy League. Here's a young man that's a rim protector, a volume rebounder, obviously a good defender. We know how important that end of the court is for Eric Musselman. We see it play out game to game in this season in this successful run. And then when you look at Jalen Llewellyn, a guard uh, out of Princeton, had a good good regular season um, in uh, first team all Ivy League is another player that's been talking to Arkansas. Ganey told me he's had multiple contacts with the coaching staff, rattle off three or four of the staff members' names. So you know there's back and forth, which you always want to pay attention to, Nick. You're going to see a lot of names where Arkansas kicks the tires on, on players in this portal, but when you really start paying attention to how, how many of those continue on with multiple contacts, because that typically signifies the players that Arkansas is truly interested in because there's more banter, more back and forth, and they start building that relationship. And it's always kind of played out that way, not only for Arkansas, but other teams, but we pay attention to that and we're keeping an eye on that, but it's portal season. Arkansas is still in its season, still, still plenty to play for, but they don't take a day off. They, they're in that portal daily, whether they're on the East Coast in Buffalo or San Francisco, back home in Fayetteville, they're working those phone lines when these players get in the portal because there's only, after today, there's only 16 teams left still playing. And with so many teams out in Division One, you got players now, their seasons are over, getting in the portal and Arkansas is doing its due diligence. Uh, it's really an exciting time uh, to, for, for me because – I cover recruiting, but basketball is 365 days a year, and no coach in college basketball, I don't think, maximizes that notion like Eric Melsman does. As they call him, the importer. 16 teams playing college basketball left it means every recruit in the country is watching only 16 teams, and that's good when you're the Arkansas Razorbacks. They have a chance to go up against Gonzaga Thursday, hopefully advance to a second straight Elite Eight. Kevin McPherson, thank you so much for joining us on our Hogs Hoops Report. Enjoy the rest of March, man. We'll see how it goes next week. We'll talk. Madness continues. <laughs> More Big Trail Show after.